Welcome back, Lara. This is the last part of our series um, on heavy bleeding or heavy periods. And um, we're going to be looking in this part of the series at natural treatments. Um, your beautiful books are full of them. <laughs> um, and uh, where I think we start, Lara, is um, with prometrium or bioidentical progesterone. Um, yep. And, you know, it, it does fall in both categories. It is sort of a yep. medical treatment. You do need a script for it, um, but yep. it's bioidentical. So it's identical to what the body naturally produces. Correct. Um, can you yeah. talk about your experience with these now? Yeah, well, it lightens periods. As I said in our first session, progesterone is the hormone that lightens periods because it thins the uterine lining. And as we talked about in the second session, progesterone, such as the levonorgestrel in the in the hormonal IUD or the progestins used in the pill also prevent heavy flow, lighten flow. Um, but progesterone can do that too. And it, the, the thing with progesterone, real progesterone, as you said, body identical progesterone, bioidentical, or what used to be called natural progesterone, it um, you need more of it. So that, where it's a little different than the progestins is you just need to take a bigger dose. And so that can be, that costs more than progestins. I've had, every time I'm with a gynecologist or like, you know, just as a colleague, I'm sort of asking, I said, is there a reason? Like, I'm just trying to, I'm really just trying to work it out why progesterone has not been on the radar medically, like why it hasn't, why it's not routinely used for lightening flow because my argument would be it works plus it has all the nice side benefits of real progesterone as opposed to the side effects of progestins in fact in a lot of ways in the brain and the breasts and the hair and the, just all other systems progesterone and progestins have almost opposite effects so in many cases progesterone is much nicer for the body in general so i ask the doctors what like i'm just trying to figure it out like why are doctors not sort of using there. it and one of the main reasons is cost. So wow. they're like, well, real progesterone costs more. And that is true. Although interestingly in New Zealand, I don't know what's going to happen in Australia, but so our progesterone here is not prometrium. It's called eutrogestin for if you have any New Zealand listeners. And from December 1st, which is just a month away, it will be funded, which wow. means it's going to be, yeah, I guess in Australia, you'd call it being on the, on the PBS or what, what do you call it there? Yeah. So it's, yeah. it will be, yeah, inexpensive. So wow. that's great news for women in New Zealand. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a protocol for using it for heavy periods. Um, the one I cite in my book is a protocol put together by the reproductive endocrinologist, Gerilyn Pryor, who helped me with both books. She and I wrote a paper together about progesterone, actually. She's written a lot about, she's, she's a scientist as well as a practicing clinician. And she talks she has a paper that like a, a document that's written for doctors kind of to explain how to use essentially prometrium to lighten flow and so yeah it's it would yeah. be different it would be a different protocol than with um perimenopause. With teens yeah okay very good question is that the, uh, yeah so teenagers they often don't need progesterone okay. i mean i think they can have it I, I, I think it's okay to give it. I mean, certainly in, I, in my view, it's still better than progestins. Mm -hmm. um, but they, like I said, depending if they're a healthy teen and they're just going through that calibration phase that we talked about in the previous session, like just their, you know, their estrogen receptors are getting used to all that estrogen. They're, they haven't ovulated yet. So they're just getting, growing up. Basically their hormonal system is maturing so it can start mm -hmm. ovulating and making progesterone. And then periods are going to lighten anyway. So mm -hmm. I find they, I rarely... I find they don't need it. Yeah. Who needs the prometrium is the 45 year old who's bleeding through her clothes. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's where it's, where it's situated. And I, I mean, truly I hope going forward, it's going to be more mainstream actually. Um, yeah. I think it yeah. is happening Mara, Cause I'm yeah. seeing that movement as well. I'm getting women yeah. going, I've been recommended prometrium. Nice. I'm like, okay, great. And they're like, oh, awesome. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and the other beautiful benefits of prometrium is, you know, that allopregnenolone, yes. um, GABA, beautiful deep sleep. And these are things that all get knocked out um, that can sometimes be the cause of the heavy bleeding. You know, that HPA, um, sure. especially women yeah, in the time of life, they're under a lot of stress. Um, you know, they're usually at the height of their career. They're still usually juggling families. 
Um, and so the Prometrium just ensures that beautiful, peaceful yeah. sleep and that nervous system reset. Um, and I, I'm nice. a big fan of it as well. Yeah. And as you, as I hope people understand, listening to this, you should take it at bedtime yeah. because taking progesterone, oral progesterone during the day can make you feel really weird, yeah. kind of groggy. Right. So right. just to preempt any mistakes around that, take it at bedtime. And the other thing that, I mean, just responding to you talking about how some of the other side benefits from progesterone and how that itself could help with heavy periods, not apart from its direct period lightening effect, one would be its support of thyroid and autoimmune Mm. disease, basically. And the other thing, just as another benefit, uh, progesterone can really help with perimenopausal migraines. Mm. Um, And Another, sorry, another mechanism is that progesterone is anti, can be antihistamine. And in the last session, you and I spoke about the role of histamine mm-hmm. in Do you want to talk flow or mass cells. It's antihistamine for those of us that love Yeah, to it upregulates. Um, well, it does. I think it can stabilize mast cells in some women. There seems to be some variability in that. Um, and also progesterone upregulates the DAO enzyme in the gut that helps clear Histamine. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Whereas estrogen downregulates it. I forgot just make sure I've got that right. Yeah. Estrogen so downregulates yes, it. So right. increases his that's a mechanism by which estrogen increases histamine. That's yeah. right. Lovely. <laughs> um, so what's not to love about Prometrium, right? But there are some other beautiful natural remedies. Um, yes. The other one, Laura, and again, it, this kind of sits medical, um, but it's nutritional, and that's iron infusions. Quite often um, these women are very iron deficient. And there is this phenomenon where the lower your iron gets, the heavier you start to bleed. Yeah, so definitely. Occasionally, uh, if we bring women's iron back up, yep. it tends to lighten the flow as well. Doesn't usually correct the reason why they were having heavy bleeding in the first place, um, but definitely helps to correct that sort of cycle that women get caught in. Um, we do a lot of iron infusions here and we're quite fussy yep. about the iron that we use. Mm-hmm. Um, but I definitely wanted mm-hmm. to put that one in as part of the Yeah, thing. I agree. Yeah. Uh, magnesium glycinate and taurine. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, they're wonderful for perimenopause in general. They can help with H- insulin yeah. sensitivity. Yeah. yeah. They stabilize the nervous system. Um, there can be a whole, we haven't really talked about it, but like the, um, an underlying problem with insulin resistance or prediabetes yeah. or PCOS can also contribute to heavy periods, mainly because there's no ovulation happening in that often in that situation. So that's another area where my favorite combo of magnesium taurine can help. I, I would say those nutrients don't necessarily have direct well, period lightening effects. I guess the other thing just on the insulin resistance topic is insulin resistance itself. High insulin can make periods heavier because yeah. insulin is a growth hormone and, and that includes on the endometrial lining. So yeah. Uh, but yeah, other natural treatments would be the whole right. antihistamine side of things. Cause we yeah. spoke about using antihistamines in session two. And so of course, there's there's many natural ways to many natural antihistamine approaches. We talk a little bit about how progesterone has that effect, but also you can do a lot with diet. So my big one is dairy-free. Now, like I would like to see research, you know, better understand why dairy-free can lighten periods and make periods less painful in a lot of women, that research doesn't fully exist yet. So I'm more just kind of mechanistically speculating at this point, but I think a big part of what's going on is what I mentioned earlier about all the, the, the number of immune or mast cells in the uterine lining mm-hmm. and just the sort of general inflammatory immune response generally that some people get from A1 casein in normal dairy. Now, not everyone gets that, which no. is where like so many things in health, when you you try to look at it and then there's going to be some people who are like, I drink, you know, I have tons of dairy and I'm fine. And my periods are fine. It's like, okay, that's, that's real. That's a thing. But for those, I, I think it's about one in three people who have a particular enzyme in the gut that basically um, turns a one casein, a particular dairy protein into an inflammatory peptide for those people it's very real and dairy sense it's it's like a dairy type of dairy sensitivity although it's not an allergy exactly it's just an, inf- an inflammatory reaction and it can affect premenstrual mood symptoms fluid retention you know um, immune problems generally like recurrent kind of throat and chest infections and heavy periods and 
some other ones that I'm not listing. So you probably, I mean, you would have seen 25 years as a naturopath yourself. You just, you know, when there's a dairy sensitive person, like there's, there's a whole and it's been through there. their whole life. Usually yeah, there's a whole it's, picture of tonsillitis, yeah. kid, needing growth, yes, exactly. sinus infections, chest infections, yeah. and then they go on yeah. and their periods start and they're heavy right from yes. the start, they're on and off. Yeah. Painful periods are usually part of the phenomena and acne, Yes, um, the, pick, the whole PICOS picture. And interestingly, Lara, it's usually the first thing I do. I go, look, let, we'll do some testing. Let's see if we can work out what's going on. But I want you to do one thing between now and when you come back. And that's just 100% take dairy out of your diet. Come back and tell yeah. me what that does. So I like to do it as a standalone treatment. Right. So the patient can actually get a sense of, oh, this is what dairy is doing. And they, there's no confusion. So I usually do that one up front. That's- um, and the big thing that I see quite often with my young patients is that acne just clears up, just I know. clears up. It, and, but because it's the base, you know, young people are like, <laughs> I would never eat dairy again if it means I don't yeah. have pimples. So that's where it's a lovely diagnostic way of doing it and getting some real clear buying from the, the patient as well. So, I agree. It's a way to assess. Yeah, because with the dairy sensitive people, it's not going to be like it's not going to be subtle. It will be yeah. whoa, oh, yeah. the horses like yeah. I feel really, really different, and yeah. so that's good information. And I would say, for what it's worth, through my lens, or often with my patients and myself, because I'm one of the I have been fortunately my dairy sensitivity was picked up at in my early twenties, so that oh. was a lucky thing. But um, I find that myself and a lot of people who don't react well to a one casein can have goat and sheep uh, yeah. and a2 dairy so there's various kinds of dairy real dairy like animal dairy out there that does not have that inflammatory mm-hmm. protein so that's a bonus you know that sort of does diversify and usually there's butter's okay too. <laughs> yeah there's options butter is usually okay yeah so without going too much down the rabbit hole of dairy sensitivity it's a, it's really a big one for periods one, yeah <laughs> um some other nutrients that help is antihistamines quercetin is a beautiful yes. antihistamine vitamin Definitely. C. I'm just going to list them off. Um, yeah. Lactobacillus rhamnosus helps yes. with that mast cell activation um, nice. at the microbiome level. Yeah. And PEA, which is another yes. one that's getting a lot of attention as a mast cell stabilizer. Um, that's and beautiful. Yeah, I haven't prescribed it much yet, but I'm familiar with it. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's very dose dependent. Um, I think oh. in the beginning we weren't prescribing the right doses, but there's a lot more research out now about the higher doses and or depending on what you're using it for. Um, but as a mast cell stabilizer, sometimes it can be a standalone uh, and can work better than antihistamine because it has a broader reach. Than the yeah, what dose? Do you mind saying it on air or you want to tell me? I'm just yeah. curious what dose so you find. Generally, like. you need to get around 2,400 milligrams of that one. Yeah. Where I'm just you know, take, I'm just making a mental note for my patients. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So um, try the higher doses if you're not getting results at the lower doses. Some patients do. Um, yeah, and you know if they're not if they don't get results at the two thousand four hundred, it's not going to work for them. Exactly, you can kind of pull it back out. Another, and there's lots of herbal medicines that also do help with heavy flow via several mechanisms. Part of it's going to be immune stabilization. Another one I'd mention is curcumin, yeah. um, which I find is quite period lightening in some people. But one there's a caveat with curcumin, unfortunately, <laughs> which is that it does um, block the uptake of iron. So exactly. you really do have to, I guess, well, the way I handle it, I mean, is just take it at a totally separate meal, like a completely different time yeah. of day. Yeah. And I'm, I feel yeah. like that's okay, but yeah. it's just something to think about. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. important. And it's it's my little thing with curcumin as well. I'm like, yeah, but I've got this low iron. But in patients yeah. who have an unusually high iron, it's a beautiful remedy. Obviously. Right, it chelates iron too. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a, I've got one other nutrient that I think is worthwhile touching base on, and that's iodine. Um, yes. You know, it can help to organize the estrogens. We know. Um, with heavy bleeding, it's this estrogen roller coaster that people are on, and the progesterone is not opposing that. Um, we've got the thyroid involved, and we know the thyroid's quite involved. Oh, yeah. yeah, we're good. I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there? Do you have any other thoughts on? Yeah. Yes. Let's talk about iodine. Iodine a little bit here. Iodine. Um, actually, before. Actually, before we get to it, though, I'll just, as a quick mention, we won't go in deep dive into it, but calcium deglucrate is another great oh, nutrient yes. for 
clearing yeah. estrogen, mm. keep preventing that those high estrogen spikes. And the other thing that prevents high estrogen spikes is no alcohol, which, and that's mm. all I'm going to say. I'm not going to, mm. we're not going to go into detail in alcohol, but alcohol is not friendly to the perimenopausal brain, uterus, estrogen, anything. It's yeah, it's um, problematic. So, but back to iodine, um, it has an anti-estrogen effect, which I think is happening at the receptor in part. It's also promoting healthy estrogen detoxification or clearance. It's an, it can be, an, again, it's one of those nutrients that can be an absolute game changer for high estrogen symptoms, including heavy periods, but also famously for breast pain, like that fibrocystic benign breast pain that can happen in at any age, but in particular in women's forties, the properly given dosed iodine can eliminate that symptom. Like, like it never happened. Like the symptom never existed. So that's what, um, very broadly, like just very generally, I'll say you, every, you should be careful with, I mean, people listening should yeah. be careful with iodine, um, because it's it is well true. It, it is true that too much can really do bad things to the thyroid. So that's particularly true if there's an underlying problem with the autoimmune thyroid disease family that we talked about history. in the first session family so yeah. family history of thyroid disease this is one of the one of the reasons i screen for thyroid antibodies and i'll tell you the three reasons i screen for it so i'm curious about the thyroid itself like what kind of you know if there's a subclinical problem here that maybe needs to be identified i sometimes use the existence of a significant number of thyroid antibodies as a surrogate marker for gluten sensitivity which is mm. kind of a cuz usually yeah. that's that autoimmune picture where gluten does come into it whereas mm -hmm. a lot of women i think are fine with gluten so i'd like to try to understand what i'm dealing with mm -hmm. and then the third reason to screen for thyroid antibodies is so i can decide whether it's safe to give iodine or not because if thyroid antibodies are present then i just basically don't give it or give very low microgram doses but mm -hmm. for a woman who does not have anything wrong with her thyroid thyroid is fine no thyroid autoimmunities but has breast pain and high estrogen I give one to three milligrams wow. of iodine, which is 1,000 to 3,000 micrograms. So I'm not saying to your viewers, don't necessarily run out and do that, but like no. you could talk to your practitioner about it. And I give um, molecular iodine, which is as opposed to potassium iodide, which is um, preferentially going to be taken up into estrogen sensitive tissue rather than the thyroid. I mean, it still will affect thyroid, but um, it's just mm -hmm. a little bit easier to use for women's safer. health it's safe I guess arguably safer but not totally yeah. safe um and then you still even if even if everything looked good and you're safe like for my patients I would just say to them do come back and get a thyroid test like in six months or 12 months like let's not just keep you on this forever with no monitoring mm -hmm. and it's usually fine but occasionally if someone does say oh my thyroid's gone a little weird then just stop it so that's right away yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And you retest the antibodies as well, three to six months. Yeah, after. sometimes, yeah, but not not frequently, but yeah. Yeah. So that I mean, that's I think we did a pretty good <laughs> overview oh, of did. some yeah. of the heavy period. I mean, there's others, as I said, there's other herbal medicines that are beautiful for this. Lithania, All the buplerum, the buplerum, buplerum mixes. Yes. Um yep, beautiful. I find are quite helpful. So if you're working with a herbalist or naturopath or herbalist, I think there's things that can be done. And especially that, as we said earlier, that they could be, the treatments could be started in conjunction with something I mean, like ibuprofen or tranexamic acid. And then as needed, you can you know, stop those medications or antihistamine can also lighten flow, as we said in session two. As you're doing the investigations and under yes. the drivers and the court, yeah. and then you're treating yeah. at that level as opposed to just sort of using the Band-Aid effect. Um, you and I are both a fan if we've got some great band-aids, let's stick them on. Yeah. Um, exactly. While we while we deal with drivers in the cause. Mm -hmm. Um, Laura, thank you so much. Yes. It's been fantastic chatting with you. I've absolutely loved meeting you. Um, yeah. I'd like to thank you from all the women on the planet for your work and dedication mm -hmm. to this um, sector of the community. It's really oh, beautiful you. work you're doing. It's well researched and um, it's so informative. So thank you, thank you, oh. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll just say it's always a delight to speak with naturopaths. I mean, in my work, I speak with a lot of different people, as you can imagine, you know, scientists and doctors. And but speaking to naturopaths, I do feel like I'm coming home a little bit. And as I 
and as we you and I met over in I was up in Brisbane um a couple months ago and so for me even though I live in New Zealand now Mm -hmm. and I'm Canadian originally I my almost you know decade and a half as an Australian naturopath really left an imprint on me so I still feel very connected to the Australian naturopathic community which is yeah so lucky to have you (laughs) have a great day Laura yeah thank you thank you